I'm Michael Connolly. This is the Los Angeles River. It's the Forgotten River. It plays no part in the social identity of this city. There are no boats on this river. There's no cafes or restaurants. There aren't even any fish in this river. It's not like you find in New York with the Hudson River or the Chicago River elsewhere. It runs behind gas stations and fire stations and work yards. It runs behind fences and barbed wire and walls and hedges. People don't come to this river. Los Angeles once had a uh, free-flowing river, but it was prone to flood, and it would take out big chunks of the city with it. So the city fathers, five or six decades ago, had an idea. Let's capture the river in stone. Let's put it in concrete and control it. It worked pretty good, except when the rains come, it fills up, and it becomes dangerous. It becomes deadly. It runs like a snake through the whole city, more than 50 miles. And like a snake, it lies in wait for rain. When it rains, the snake becomes a dragon. Its walls fill to near the top with fierce moving water. In some places, they built the river wide. And in some places, it's very narrow. In the narrows is where the danger lies. The water moves faster. When you grow up near the river in Los Angeles, you know one thing. You stay away from the narrows. When the rains come, the water fills and moves fast and fierce. It can take you away quickly. You dip a foot in, and they find you 12 miles down the line. My new book is called The Narrows. It continues the story of the poet. FBI agent Rachel Walling comes back, but this time she's riding with a new partner, Harry Bosch. Together, they look for the man who disappeared into the dark so long ago, and the trail leads them into the narrows. She stared up at the ceiling. She listened to the wind outside and heard the branches of the azalea scratching against the window. She wondered if it had been the scratching in the glass or some other noise from within the house that had awakened her. Then her cell phone rang. She wasn't startled. She calmly reached to the bed table. She brought the phone to her ear and was fully alert when she answered, her voice showing no indication of sleep. Agent Walling, she said. Rachel, it's Sherry Day. Rachel knew right away that Sherry Day meant Quantico. It had been four years since the last time. Rachel had been waiting. Where are you, Rachel? I'm in Rapid City, Sherry. What is it? She answered after a long moment of silence. He's resurfaced. He's back. This is the Chateau Marmont Hotel where I've been working on finishing the Narrows. This is actually the room where Jack McAvoy stayed in The Poet. It's where he met The Poet. He huddled in the dark of the storm drainage tunnel, resting and concentrating his mind on mastering the pain. Already he knew there was infection. The wound was minor in terms of damage, a through and through shot that tore an upper abdominal muscle, but little else before leaving. But it was dirty, and he could feel the poisons beginning to move through his body, making him want to lie down and sleep. He looked down the length of the dark tunnel. Only stray light leaking from somewhere up above made it this far down lost light. He pushed himself up the slippery wall until he was standing, and then he began moving again. One day, he thought as he moved, make it through the first day and you'll make it through the rest. It was the mantra he repeated in his mind. In a sense, there was relief. Despite the pain and now the hunger, there was relief. No more separation. The facade was gone. Now there was only Eidolon, and Eidolon would triumph. They were nothing before him and could do nothing now to stop him. Nothing. 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 His voice echoed down the tunnel into the blackness and disappeared. With one hand clamped over his wound, he headed that way. Things have changed in the seven years since. The Marlboro Man's been replaced by vanilla vodka. I don't know what that means in the state of affairs of Los Angeles. You know, I never really planned to write a sequel to The Poet. I kind of like the idea of there being one, at least one loose end in my fictional universe. But as the real world became more uncertain, that loose end really bothered me, and that's why I started writing The Narrows. Jack doesn't make it back in this book. He's replaced, you could say, by Harry Bosch. I just wanted to bring my best guy out for this one. I think maybe I only know one thing in this world, one thing for sure, and that is that the truth does not set you free. Not like I've heard it said, and not like I've said myself the countless times I sat in small rooms in jail cells and urged ragged men to confess their sins to me. A few years ago, I started writing about Harry Bosch in first person. It's experimental, 
I had written, I think, seven or eight books with him in third person and was just looking for a switch and uh, something new. But experimentation led to dedication. I really enjoyed the experience and I felt I got closer to him as a character, got deeper into him. And I believe that that would translate to what the reader felt. So with the Narrows, I continue with him in first person. And I, I'm really probing the connections I have to him. The truth does not salvage you or make you whole again. It does not allow you to rise above the burden of lies and secrets and wounds to the heart. The truths I have learned hold me down like chains in a dark room, an underworld of ghosts and victims that slither around me like snakes. It is a place where the truth is not something to look at or behold. It is a place where evil waits. I knew this going in on the day I took the case that would take me into the narrows. I knew that my life's mission would always take me to the places where evil waits, to the places where the truth that I might find would be an ugly and horrible thing. And still I went without pause. So I brought Rachel Walling back from that first story of the poet, and I added Harry Bosch to the mix. I think it makes for a, uh, a pretty good pairing, these two. They're uh, different philosophies in the way they go about their work, but ultimately they're very much the same in what they want. The rain fell cold on my face and neck as I got out of the Mercedes. I pulled the collar on my jacket up and started heading back towards Valerio. Rachel came over and walked next to me without saying a word. When we got to the corner, we used the wall surrounding the corner property as cover and looked down into the cul-de-sac in the dark house where Ed Thomas had parked his car. There was no sign of Thomas or anyone else. Every window at the front of the house was dark. But even in the grayness, I could tell that Rachel was right. It was a house from the photo the poet had left for us. I could hear the river but not see it. It was hidden behind the homes, but its furious power was almost palpable, even from this distance. In storms like this, the whole city washed itself out over its smooth concrete surfaces. It snaked through the valley and around the mountains to downtown, and from there west to the ocean. It was a mere triple most of the year, a municipal joke even. But a rainstorm would awaken the snake and give it power. It became the city's gutter, millions and millions of gallons banging against its thick stone walls, tons of water raging to get out, moving with a terrible force and momentum. I remembered a boy who was taken when I was a kid. I didn't know him. I knew of him. Four decades later, I even remembered his name. Billy Kinsey was playing on the river's shoulder. He slipped in, and in a moment he was gone. They found his body hung up in a viaduct 12 miles away. What is it? Rachel whispered. Nothing. I was thinking about the river, trapped between those walls. When I was a kid, we called it the Narrows. When it rains like this, the water moves fast. It's deadly. When it rains, you stay away from the Narrows. But we're going to the house. Same thing, Rachel. Be careful. Stay out of the Narrows. I've been very lucky. I've been able to publish 13 books before this one. That's a really big universe, uh, a made-up universe. And so when it was time to write the 14th, I kind of looked at that universe and came away with it with one loose end, and that was the poet. What happened to him? Where did he go? It's been seven years. What has happened? The poet huddled in the darkness. He tried to stave off all the emotions and concentrate on the moment. He had been here before cornered in the dark. He had survived before and he would survive now. What was important now was to concentrate on the moment, draw a strength from the darkness. He heard his pursuer call out to him. He was close now. Bosch had the weapon, but he had the darkness. Darkness had always been on his side. He pressed back against the concrete and willed himself to disappear in the shadows. He would be patient to make his move when the time was right. I really believe that what happens in the writing process translates to the reading process. If I'm right about that, then I think the Narrows is in good shape. I really had a good time with this one. I really enjoyed going back to these characters from the earlier books and exploring where they've been and what's happened to them. To add Harry Bosch to this made it all the better for me. Like most of my stories, this is a dark journey. But my hope is that when you ride with Harry Bosch, you're with somebody who knows how to find the lost light, those moments of grace that make our lives and our stories worthwhile. I hope you enjoy the Narrows.